and just by way of response and overflow of our hearts, we pause to give back to you a generous God this morning. And thank you that it's Christmas. It's the day we get to celebrate that we win because Jesus came. And uh, we thank you for that, but we give now freely because we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor Bill, God bless you. Thank you, Pastor Paul. God bless you. Good morning. Merry Christmas. We are so delighted that you're here today. And you know, this is one of the rare times I was trying to remember the last time we just had one service. And we didn't have a 9 o'clock, didn't have 11 o'clock, didn't have a Spanish service at the 2. Just one. And it's been a long time. So it may be uh, kind of uh, close net, but that's just nice. You can just uh, cut up next to the person next to you and enjoy uh, the service this morning. But one of the uh, humanitarian ministries we're involved in is called Bear Creek Water. Started many years ago. We recycle uh, bottles and cans, and then we take that money and we work with an organization called Living Water International out of Houston, Texas. And they have uh, drilling well uh, rigs in 20 different countries around the world, in uh, Latin and South America, in Africa, in India, uh, in Asia. And we have drilled now 94 wells since we began. <clears throat> And we're providing clean drinking water for thousands of children and families in 20 different countries. And you know, we take water so much for granted, and yet most of the world uh, drinks a lot of dirty water. And so uh, we're delighted we work with uh, Living Water International. Several months ago, I was in Houston at, their, at the quarterly board meeting of Living Water International. I was talking to Mike Mantell. He's the CEO. And some of you may know my wife passed away this past year of cancer, and Mike's wife had just gotten diagnosed with cancer as well. And I was praying with him, and he sent us a video message uh, greeting that uh, he'd like to share with us this morning. So watch the screen behind me. Thank you, Pastor Bill. And, and everyone involved with Bear Creek Water. Because of you, 2017 has been an incredible year for Living Water International. Your generosity has allowed us to bring water and living water to over 250,000 women, men, and children around the world this year. Through hurricanes, floods, earthquakes, and many other challenges, we remain mindful that God remains faithful and that He uses faithful supporters like you to enable His mighty work. You are out there every Sunday sorting and collecting drum after drum of recycled plastic bottles and So this coming year, 2018, is going to be a great year. We're going to drill well number 100 this coming uh, year in 2018. We'll have a big celebration for that. And, and thank you for your ongoing, uh, continuous support of what we're doing uh, in the world. Well, Christmas really is the most wonderful time of the year. And yet, in spite of it being such a wonderful time of the year, it always amazes me that there are people and even organizations that still have uh, a problem with, with, with Christmas and with Christianity. I heard just this morning that the very first text message, how many of you text message? How many just text message a few minutes ago, right? And um, the first text message came out in, in December of 1992. And you know what it was? The very first text message, it was a, a techie guy who was uh, texting his boss for the very first time. It was Merry Christmas. The first text message was, was about Christmas. And yet there are people who still get hung up about the influence of Christianity in our culture. And it just amazes me that they, these organizations are all upset about a God they don't even believe in. In fact, there's an organization called Freedom From Religion out of Madison, Wisconsin. And one of their missions is to try to get nativity scenes out of public places 
and to take God and Christianity out of any public place. In fact, they have a, a team of lawyers. This happened just a couple of years ago. They threatened the city of Lodi with a lawsuit because they were having a prayer by Christian pastors before the meeting of their, the city council. And uh, the city council debated what they should do about it and everything and contacted the city attorney. And they finally decided, well, we don't want to go to court because it costs so much money to defend ourselves in court. And so the city of Lodi kind of chickened out. And uh, what they did is, what they do is they start the meeting. They call the meeting to order. And then they uh, have the Pledge of Allegiance and something. Then they uh, adjourn the meeting. Then they have one of us pastors get up and pray. And then they reconvene the meeting. And so the prayer is never in the minutes of the meeting because it's not officially having the meeting because they've adjourned the meeting and then re-call uh, to order a after that. But it, it, just, it just amazes me. And so I, I think we need reminding this morning about the real meaning of Christmas. And so I've invited a friend to come and share with you via video exactly what the real meaning of Christmas is. And is there anyone who knows what Christmas is all about? Sure, Charlie Brown, I can tell you what Christmas is all about. Lights, please. And there were in the same country shepherds, a mighty in the field, keeping watch over the flock by night, and lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them. And the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid, and the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. That's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. So you know what the meaning of Christmas is really all about. And when we think about the Christmas story, we can't help but realize that when Christ was born, people were attracted to come to his birthplace. Some rather strange people, like a bunch of shepherds. And in that era and time, shepherds were not the most uh, highly thought of uh, group of people. They were kind of the, the low class individuals of society. But also there were some religious dudes from Persia that took a long journey to come and see Jesus. And I want us to unpack that very familiar Christmas story. If you have your program, there are some notes, and you can take those notes out and follow along with me this morning. And we're all familiar with, with the story of the wise men. You know, the wise men uh, lived in what is now today Iran, and they made that journey all the way from Iran to the land of Israel, first to Jerusalem and then on to uh, Bethlehem. And Matthew 2, 1 and following says this. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. When Herod the king, when Herod the king heard these things, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, Are not the least among the rulers of Judah? For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. 
When Herod, then when Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared, he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring him word back to me that I may come and worship him also. When they heard the king, they departed. And behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. These wise men came to worship the king. And on Christmas Eve today, I want us to think about uh, a couple of aspects of how these men, these wise men, worshipped the Lord, and at least uh, three aspects of it. And the first would be this. These wise men, they had an expectant spirit of worship. It was an expectant worship. They came expecting to worship a newborn baby king. They traveled about a 1,000 miles. They had to go by horseback and, and walking uh, all that way. It was rough terrain. These wise men are also in the Bible called magi. Magi is a Greek word. It's plural for magos. And we get our English word magic from this, this word. And these men were not uh, Jewish religious leaders. They were from the east. They had a whole different uh, system. Uh, they may have been in Zoroastrianism, which was the religion of, of that uh, geographical era during that time. They were probably astrologers and astronomers. Now, astrology is the study of uh, the stars and how the stars can possibly impact our individual lives. Astrology is not scientific. Astrology is not credible. Uh, horoscopes are kind of hocus pocus. You know, they're not really real. Uh, and these guys were probably into that, but they were also astronomers because astronomy is a science. And astronomy is the observations of stars and moons and, and planets and, and galaxies and observing those things. And these guys are probably involved in both. And throughout the Bible, there were many wise men or magi, ma magicians, we, we would call them. You may re recall the story of Moses when he was trying to get Pharaoh to release the children of Israel out of Egyptian uh, captivity. And Pharaoh brought his magicians to combat the powerful miracles that Moses was doing. And then later on in Genesis, when uh, Joseph was uh, a slave in, in Egypt as well, and when he was called to interpret the king's dreams, uh, the Pharaoh's magicians couldn't interpret his dreams, but because Joseph was uh, from a godly man who had God's spirit on him, he could interpret that dream. Then in the book of Daniel, there were many Babylonian magicians, and if you you know the story of, of Daniel, Yershak, Meshach, and Abednego, his three buddies, you know? And they were able, because they had the Spirit of God on them, to defeat the magicians of Babylon as well. So these wise men probably knew about Daniel, the Old Testament prophet, and what he had done. When they saw the star, they were drawn to it because they were into astronomy and astrology, and they followed it looking for this king. And I want you to notice they came expecting, but they also made great effort, great effort to worship Jesus. They traveled about a thousand miles. There were bandits along the way. There were no paved roads back in those days. There were no Marriott you could stop at and spend the night in. Um, there were no restaurants along the way. And they came expecting, after a long journey, to see and meet this new king. If they had made that much effort to come to see Jesus, how great of an effort do we make today to meet with Jesus? Do you come on Sunday morning with a spirit of expectancy? Do you come on Sunday morning wanting to God, I want God to speak to me today? Do you have that, that spirit of, of excitement that you get to worship God with a whole bunch of other people. Now, yes, you can worship God alone. You can be driving in your car with worship music playing on your radio or your CD, and you can worship God in, uh, a, a, when you're totally alone. But there's something synergistically spiritual about worshiping God with a whole bunch of people like we did this morning. 
there's something that can't be reproduced in your car when you're here with all these folks. It can't be reproduced when you're home alone like we have here on a Sunday morning. In fact, I really think sometime around Friday afternoon or certainly early Saturday, you need to have this spirit of expectancy uh, in your heart that says, hey, tomorrow's Sunday and I get to worship God with all of these people. We need this spirit of expectancy, coming expecting to receive something. But not only do these men have a spirit of expectancy in coming to worship the king, their worship was also expressive. They expressed their worship. Notice what the Bible says, Matthew 2, verse 10. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. Now, the Bible could have said that they just rejoiced. The Bible said, could have said, well, they rejoiced with joy. The Bible could have said they rejoiced with great joy. But the Bible says they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. These guys are really into expressing their worship. They had exceedingly great joy. And when we worship Jesus, whether it's on March or August or on Christmas Eve Sunday, we need to worship him with an expression of, of worship and, and joy. I believe the Bible, Bible teaches that. Remember last Sunday we talked about the word worship? And I said that the, the Greek word worship comes from a, a, a Greek word, pros noea. Pros means to kind of bend down, and noea is from the verb noar, which means to kiss. So, you know, that's what the word worship means. So, guys, when you bend down and kiss your wife in one area, you're, you're kind of worshiping. Not worshiping her, but worshiping the gift of love that God's given you as, as a husband and a wife. You see, you can give without loving but you cannot love without giving. If you love someone, you're going to give to them. You, you have to. You're, you're compelled to. It has to be expressed. And if you love God, you have to give to God. You have to express that love to God. Don't be like the guy uh, who was married 30 years and his wife uh, said to him after 30 years, Honey, you, you never say you love me anymore. And he said, Hey, I told you I loved you. 30 years ago, and if I change my mind, I'll let you know. <laughs> you know, we have, we have to express our love. It has to be expressed. Notice in your notes, just a few verses. I could have list pages of these uh, verses here. Psalm 47 says, Come, everyone, clap your hands. Shout to God with joyful praise. Psalm 95, Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Psalm 95, Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God. Psalm 134, lift up holy hands in prayer and praise to the Lord. You say, well, Pastor Bill, those are all Old Testament verses. Well, let's go to the New Testament. 1 Timothy 2.8 says, I want men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. New Testament says, men, lift up your hands. Without wrath, that means without anger, not being mad. And without doubting, without questioning in, in your heart. I grew up in a, a Baptist uh, family. My dad went to a Baptist church. He was a Baptist deacon. And so I went to Baptist church from the time I can remember. And in the Baptist church that, that we went to, you know, they had a, an organ, an old organ, Hammond organ, and they had a little upright piano. And everybody had a hymn book. And it was a big book. I mean, it took two hands to hold the hymn book. And there was a guy who would stand up in, in front, and this guy would, would do this. As you sang, he would wave his hands. Ever, anybody ever see that? You know, in the old Baptist church? And you would stand there perfectly still, holding this hymn book with, with both hands, and you would sing all eight verses and a chorus after each verse of him from page number 287, and you would just stand there and never, never move. And I kind of grew up in, in that atmosphere, in that environment. And then about, I don't know, 30-some years ago, uh, I had my, my family with me, and we were down in, in Anaheim. And I had just uh, made a presentation about a work I was involved with in India, and we were at the Anaheim Vineyard Church. And uh, back 30-plus years ago, the Vineyard Church movement was really big in America. There was a thing called Vineyard Music, and Vineyard Music was really popular in the Christian church uh, throughout America and in Europe. 
John Wimber was the pastor there. And I remember being in that worship service at the uh, Anaheim Vineyard Church. And I had my, my kids with me. And they were just expressive. They were jumping around and dancing. And I remember on that Sunday something happened. And I just, I just changed. I just said, I can't be the Baptist anymore. You know, I've, you've got to express yourself. And I believe God wants us to kind of get out of our shells and express ourselves. That's why uh, Maya does that beautiful dancing on Sunday morning when she's dancing all around the front here. Well, these wise men, they came, and they had expectant worship. They had expressive worship. It was with exceedingly great joy. And they also had extravagant worship. They had extravagant worship. The Bible says when they had opened their treasures... They presented gifts to him of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And these weren't just um, casual gifts that these guys just whipped out of their saddlebags from their horse or something. You know, it had meaning. Gold represented royalty because Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And gold represented that. Frankincense was divinity. Frankincense is an incense that would be burned in the... uh, uh, Old Testament uh, temple as a prayer offering of your uh, prayers going up to the Lord. And myrrh represented humanity. Myrrh was a, 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 like a, a special oil that was used to anoint a dead body as it was, was being buried. And so these all had uh, significance. But I want you to note that these wise men, these magi, they brought the very best. Gold was very expensive. Frankincense and myrrh were valuable oils that are extracted from plants that were very, very expensive as well. They brought treasures, important, valuable treasures to the Lord. And the most valuable treasure we can bring to the Lord today is really our heart, to give our heart to God, to give our heart to the Lord, to have your heart open to the Lord at this season. This Christmas, let your heart Be open to God. So let's be expectant. In fact, the theme for our church for 2018 is the phrase, the best is yet ahead. And you're going to hear a lot about this theme going forward because I believe 2018 will be the best year the church has ever had in all of its history. 2018. I believe 2018 is going to be the very best year for you and your life in 2018. I believe it's going to be the best year for me. The best is yet to come, and we can, we can embrace that today. So we need to be expectant. Yes, the best is coming. It's, it's just around the corner. Let's be expressive. Let's get out of our shell, out of the box, and let's express our love to God first and also to, to each other. Let's express that, and let's be extravagant in, in doing that as well. Let's do our our very best. You know, if you're married, you need to give your very best to your spouse. I hope you've already brought your Christmas present. If you haven't bought it, you better get out to the mall this afternoon. I was at uh, Dillard's yesterday, and it was a zoo down there. Oh, my Lord, was it a zoo? Oh, glad that's over with. But, uh, you know, we we need to give our very best, our, our very best to God and, and to each other. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful that I've been blessed. And I, I don't say this uh, with any bragging, not braggadocious. I, I've just been blessed, and God has, has blessed me, and uh, I've, been, I've been faithful to God for many, many years. And uh, I've been able to help a lot of people out. I've, I've given cars away to people who just needed a car. I've been able to help people financially, you know, behind closed doors, just, just to help them through a difficult time. And when you manage your resources well and God blesses you, you're able to give extravagantly, extravagantly. Last Thursday, our our men's ministry did a wonderful thing. We've got a couple of of slides we'll show in the back. But we gave out about 150 ham dinners just last last Thursday night. They were in big boxes, and we had our box truck out there, and people were coming to get these uh, boxes and and things, and it was a great uh, outreach connection into our community that we do not just at Thanksgiving and Christmas time, but we do it every month uh, down in Acapulco Way at, at Loch Lomond Park there. And Christmas is the most wonderful time of the year when miracles happen. 
God delights in doing miracles. One of the songs Pastor Darrell led us in this morning was a, a song all about uh, the miracle, the, the miracle of, of Christ and the miracle of, of Christmas. And Christmas really is a time when God does miracles, miraculous things are happening all over the world. And I think this is no better illustrated than a story that I've told for the last 25 years. And as I've traveled and spoken in other churches, I've told it umpteen times. And every time I tell this story, I have to, I have to fight back my emotions because at the end, I, I, I get emotional. Many of you have heard it, but I think it bears repeating. It's a wonderful story because it's a true story. It actually appeared in Reader's Digest for the first time in the early 1950s. It's a story about a church in Nyack, New York, called the First Reformed Church. Nyack, New York is a little sleepy town north of New York City on the Hudson River, about 30 miles north. And the story actually took place in the, in the fall and Christmas season of, of 1949. And the church there, the First Reformed Church, at one time had been the, the biggest, most vibrant church in town. And through the passing of years and people moving out to the suburbs, uh, the attendance had, had shrunk and the building hadn't been cared for. And in 1949, a new pastor and his wife arrived at the First Reformed Church of Nyack, New York. And his name was Howard Shady. And when the past new pastor arrived with his wife, they brought new energy to this old congregation. And in the fall of that year, they decided they were going to fix up and repair the church building that had been kind of broken down due to, to neglect. And so they mobilized the people and they... Uh, found some extra money, did some fundraisers, and painted the place and repaired it and put brand new carpet all throughout the church. And by the second week after Thanksgiving that fall season, the church was looking really good. It was looking the best it had for, for quite a while. And a couple of days before Christmas, one of those strong New England storms had blown in from off of the Atlantic coast and blown across that area. And there was an old elm tree that the men kept meaning to cut down because it had died and they never had gotten around to it. And during that storm, a large branch broke off of that elm tree and crashed into the side of the church building right above the choir loft. Well, everyone in town knew it had been a bad storm and the men went the next morning to check out. And sure enough, there was this gapping hole right above the choir loft. And it was almost Christmas. So all they could do was get some plywood, and the guys got up there and, and nailed some plywood to, to cover the, the wall right now, and it would take quite a while to file the insurance uh, claims, and, and Christmas was right there, and they were pretty disheartened because of that. Well, the day before Christmas Eve, in town, there was a little fundraising auction for the YMCA, and the pastor and his wife went to the auction, and they auctioned off a number of things, and near the end of the auction, the auctioneer opened up a box, and he, he pulled out an old lace tablecloth. And he said, uh, who'll give me $50 for this tablecloth? $50, go lunch, $50, $50. And there was silence. No one said anything. Auctioneer said, how about $25? Someone give me $25, $25, $25, go lunch, $25, $25, $25, $25. And silence. Nobody was bidding. It was a beautiful tablecloth. It, it was older and, and certainly... Uh, had its uh, age uh, attached to it, but finally the pastor had an idea. He said, I'll give you $6.50. The auctioneer said, six fifty one, six fifty two. I sold to the man there for six fifty. So the pastor took the tablecloth. They went back to the church. He said to his wife, I've got an idea. He got a ladder out, climbed up on the ladder. He had a tack, some tacks and a hammer, and he tacked that tablecloth across the plywood covering the hole. And then when he got down and he stepped back and looked at it, it almost looked like a tapestry, a beautiful tapestry. And so the next morning was Christmas Eve morning. And the pastor was at the church getting ready to prepare for the Christmas Eve uh, candlelight service that night. And it was snowing. It's, it's cold back there this time of year. And he looked out his window and he saw an elderly woman standing on the corner of Broadway, the church is at 8 South Broadway, 
on the corner of Broadway and Main, waiting for the bus to come. And the pastor knew the buses on holidays only came every three hours. And so he went out and invited her to come out of the cold and wait inside the church. So the older woman came in and brushed the snow off of her coat, and the pastor invited her to sit down, and she had shared with him that she had come into town to interview for a job as a nanny with a family in Nyack. And she was waiting now to take the bus back, back to the city. And so as they chatted for a few minutes, suddenly the elderly woman got up, and her eyes were riveted. They were riveted on this, on this tablecloth. And she walked down the aisle, and she got as close as she could as she looked at that tablecloth, and she said to the pastor, she said, Sir, that tablecloth is my tablecloth. That's the tablecloth my husband bought me years ago. We lived in Vienna, Austria, and when the Nazis invaded, you know, my husband sent me to London, and he was going to follow me later. He had a jewelry store there in the city, and he was going to sell his inventory and, and meet me in London. They were going to come to the United States together. And I went to London, and I waited and waited for him, and he never came. And I heard he got arrested and thrown in a concentration camp and probably died. She said, I know it's my tablecloth because look in the corner. I embroidered my initials in the corner. And sure enough, it was her. Well, the pastor tried to, to comfort her, and he said, well, why don't I give you the tablecloth? She said, oh, I, I have no need for a tablecloth now. I'm, I'm old. I'm alone, I live alone, and it's much more fitting that the tablecloth stay here in the church. And so they chatted briefly. The pastor went back to work. In time, the bus came. She got on the bus and left. Well, that night, they were having the Christmas Eve service. Beautiful service. All the people had come. At the end of the service, the pastor's standing at the back door, greeting people as they leave, shaking their hands and wishing them a, a Merry Christmas. And as he's standing there, the old clockmaker comes by, an elderly gentleman. And he greets the pastor, and he says, you know, pastor, it's strange, but that, that tablecloth you hung up on the wall there, that looks just like a tablecloth I bought for my wife before the war on a business trip to uh, Amsterdam, and I, I gave it to her, and he started telling the same story the pastor had heard that day. The pastor couldn't believe it. He quickly told the elderly clock repair man that there was a lady here today, and she, I did, that was her tablecloth. And so they got on the phone, and, and they looked at the newspaper, and sure enough, there was an ad in the paper for a nanny. They called the, the number, and sure enough, they had interviewed an elderly lady who had broken English, and uh, they had her address. And so that night, late at night on Christmas Eve, the pastor and the old clock repair man made their way back into the city. They found the apartment house, walked up a couple of flights of stairs, walked down a long, dark hallway, knocked on the door. The elderly lady opened the door, and there she saw her husband, each thinking the other had died, having not seen each other for five years. And on Christmas Eve, they were reunited back together as husband and wife. God loves doing miracles. An Atlantic storm and an old tree that crashed through the side of a church building and an old tablecloth that nobody wanted through the miracle of Christmas. This amazing, amazing thing happened. And God is still in the miracle working business today. He's still bringing people together. <clears throat> You know, for some people, Christmas is a hard time of year. For others, it's a wonderful time of the year. But whether it's wonderful or hard, let the, the healing, miraculous power of the God of Christmas just permeate your, your heart. May it draw you close to God and, and close to each other during the, this wonderful Christmas season. God delights in doing miracles. Open, open your heart and let God do that miraculous healing work in your life today. God, God desires that. God, God delights that. God's thrilled about that. And may the reality of the Christ child who was born in a manger, who went to the cross, who was 
died on that cross, was buried, and came back to life again. May the miracle of the resurrected Christ just permeate in your heart today. May that joy be full and, and rich in your life. You know, Pastor Brandon, could you go get Pastor Daryl and get him out here? Because he didn't know I was going to finish early because I want to send everybody home early today. Mm. But, you know, God, God so delights in doing great things for us. And I want you to enter this Christmas season with this spirit of expectancy. Expect God to do some great things. And live with expression. Let God just ooze out of your life in love towards him and love towards each other. Be, be expressive. And watch what God will delight in doing as you become extravagant with your love to God and your love towards each other. You know, at the end of our service every Sunday, we take time to pray. It's an important value for us. And you know, at this time of the year, everyone needs prayer, and uh, many folks have special prayer needs they have. And in just a moment, we're going to have our leaders here at the front, and we're going to have you, uh, invite you to slip out from where you'll be standing in just a moment and come down here to the front, and we'd be delighted to pray for you about uh, some family member, about some friend, about a health issue, about a financial issue, about a relationship issue, whatever it is. We, we would delight in having a chance just to take a minute or two and pray for you. So would you stand together with me, please? I want to invite our leaders, if they'll come up to the front at this time. We're going to have one last uh, worship song together, and then we'll be dismissed to go home and celebrate Christmas Eve together. But uh, we do want you to have a chance to have another person just love on you through prayer. And if you have some prayer need, boy, we are here for you because we love you. And uh, we just want you to feel and be embraced by God's love today. So join Pastor Daryl. Let's worship the Lord in these closing moments.
is such a great song. Oh, come, let us adore him. We hope that it is our prayer on behalf of all the pastors and our staff that you have a wonderful Christmas. Come back tonight at 7 o'clock. We're going to have a wonderful candlelight uh, service at 7 p.m. Just be about an hour long. It'll be a, a great time to close out Christmas Eve together. And before you take off, let me encourage you to meet somebody new before you leave today and come back next Sunday, the last Sunday of the year is next Sunday, December 31st. We'll be at back to our normal schedule next Sunday morning at 9 and 11 and everything. But uh, let me just pray for you uh, before you go. Father God, thank you so much for this Christmas season. Thank you for the Christmas carols that we enjoy, that we can sing, Oh, come, let us adore him. So, Father, I ask your blessing, your favor on all these good folks that are here this morning. Bless them during this Christmas season. Fill them with joy, with your favor, with health, with your blessing in all that they do. And, Father, we just give you thanks for your kindness and your goodness to us. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. And before you go, we need to sing one more song. You know what we need to sing? We need to sing Feliz Navidad, all right? <laughs> Feliz Navidad. Feliz Navidad. Feliz Navidad. Prospero año y felicidad. Everybody, come on. Feliz Navidad. You can do a little dancing. Come on, it's okay. Feliz Navidad. We're not Baptists. You can dance. Feliz Navidad. Prospero año y Ready? I want to wish you a Merry Christmas. I want to wish you a Merry Christmas. I want to wish you a Merry Christmas from the bottom of my heart. I want to wish you a Merry Christmas. I want to wish you a Merry Christmas. I want to wish you a Merry Christmas from the bottom of my heart. One more time, ready? Feliz Navidad. Thank you, Jose Feliciano. Feliz Navidad. Feliz Navidad. Prospero año y felicidad. Feliz Navidad. Feliz Navidad. Feliz Navidad. Prospero año y felicidad. I want to wish you a Have a wonderful day.